for keys to victory against the Tennessee Titans. It's going to be a very physical football game, first and foremost. That's going to that's something that everybody knows. But in this rivalry, and it's turned into a rivalry, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals have won three straight against the Tennessee Titans. Two of those on the road, including that playoff victory, they've won seven of the last nine times against the Tennessee Titans. Mike Vrabel, though, is upset. There's no question about it. And Mike Vrabel's football team got handled. 27 to 3, they lose to the Cleveland Browns. They get 94 yards offense in that football game as a team. Derrick Henry runs 11 times, generates 20 yards. Vrabel's not a happy camper. So you got to put on the big boy pads because he's going to have his team ready to go. Double chin strap and tighten both of them, <laughs> tighten it up. He's old school. He doesn't like being embarrassed. There's, there's no two ways about that. They're going to want to get Henry going. He's going to run the ball a ton, and they are going to try to play a suffocating defense. Mike Vrabel was with the New England Patriots for quite a while. Bill Belichick has a huge influence on Mike Vrabel's career. Bill Belichick is known as a defensive guru who will show you things that you have not seen on tape whatsoever. Vrabel's going to do the same thing. He's going to have packages that has not been on tape in the first three football games. So you have to be very intelligent as a, as a player. Apply your rules. There are rules to everything. So the Bengals' offensive linemen and other people have rules to adjust and adapt to anything that defenses do. So that chess match that's going on, you don't want Mike Vrabel playing chess, and you're playing checkers, trying to <laughs> combat him playing chess. That's going to be, I think, a, an interesting factor in this football game. They're going to want to get that ground game going, though, because the Cleveland Browns rushed for 206 yards against the Bengals, averaged over five yards a carry. Baltimore rushed for 178 yards, averaged almost five yards a carry at 4.8. The Tennessee Titans, Zach Taylor has said it all week. It reminds him of an, of an AFC North team. They're that type of team. They're put together, solid running game, play good defense. The Bengals have a short week. They're trying to rest and recover from Monday night football. They have to travel. And you say, no, it's only to Tennessee. Yeah, they're only in the air for maybe less than an hour, but it's still, you have to, you're not sleeping in your own bed. You sleep, you're at a hotel. You still have to go to the stadium, bus to the airport, bus from the airport in Nashville to the stadium. It's just road travel is a lot different than just enjoying your time at home and then going and playing football against the opponent. I mean, it's, it's night and day, believe me, no matter how long or short the trip may be when you're actually in the air, you're in the air for an hour, you're in the air for two, two and a half hours. It's not a huge difference. It's all the other stuff around it. That is a, that is a big factor. Derek Henry, huh. obviously he's the straw that stirs the drink. The key with Derrick Henry, the Bengals have had success against Derrick Henry when they do two things. They make him make his first cut either behind or at the line of scrimmage. If you allow Derrick Henry to get ahead of steam, get to that second or third level of your defense before he has to make his first cut, he is a problem. This guy is 250 plus pounds and can run. Now, it takes him a while to get in full stride, but if you allow him to get there, he can be a, a, a bruising football player. There's no question about it. The other thing that you have to do with him is you can't let him get north and south, goalpost to goalpost. If he squares his shoulder pads up, runs with a good body lean, gets those pads in front of him, going north and south, he's a problem. You got to make Derrick Henry go east and west. You have to make him turn his pads to the sideline not turn his pads to the goal line, turn his pads to the sideline, make him run east and west. And eventually he'll try to make a cut, put his foot in the ground, get up the football field, but he's nowhere near as effective, in my opinion, watching him. And the Bengals have had success against him. So what you have to do is maintain your gap integrity and, and make him make his first cut early if he's trying to go north and south. And if you can, make him decide to bounce it try to go east and west, you've won that particular snap. And then 
you got to gang tackle the guy. Don't leave a teammate out there in space one-on-one -on -one against this beast. And if you are the first guy to hit him, don't hit him up high. Don't hit him up by his shoulder pads. Hit him from the waist or basically his chest. Blow his chest to his thighs. That's the area to tackle Derrick Henry. You got to hit him and wrap him up. And then everybody else, run to the football. Gang tackle this dude. He is not going to go down in space with one-on-one -on -one tackles. That's a, that's a big thing. If you try to do that, he's going to prove to you that you're dealing with a grown man. There's no two ways about it. The other key, obviously, offensively, Ryan Tannehill. This dude is a pure athlete. Um, he can hurt you with both his arms and his, his arm and his legs. There's no doubt. He's into his 12th year now. I had the privilege of covering him. I was doing big 12 games for Fox sports net and he was playing at Texas A&M at wide receiver and conference, all conference player at wide receiver his sophomore year. They had a quarterback that a little more experienced upperclassmen wanted to go with him. And Tannehill eventually took over the quarterback position. The rest is history. First round pick the Tennessee Titans. Zach Taylor was on that coaching staff at Texas A&M when Ryan Tannehill was down there. He knows the athlete that Ryan Tannehill is. Ryan Tannehill ended up going to the Miami Dolphins, uh, first round pick. Zach Taylor was on that coaching staff. Lou Anarumo was on that coaching staff. They know what makes Ryan Tannehill tick. I think that's why Lou Anarumo has had so much success against Ryan Tannehill. He knows the problem areas for Ryan Tannehill. He knows what he doesn't like. He knows what he likes. Stay away from what he likes. Give him a heavy dose of what he doesn't like. And then be different in how you get to that. Give him one look pre-snap and a totally different look post-snap. Uh, and that's make him have a little bit of hesitation uh, with, with his reads. Um, you have to stay in your pass rush lanes. If you get out of your lane with lack of discipline or you get pushed out of your lane with his feet, he can make you pay. There's no, no doubt about it. But the simulated pressures, uh, the reads that he thinks are true pre-snap that are totally false post-snap, that's what's going to make Ryan Tannehill struggle. Make him see ghosts a little bit. Three interceptions in that playoff game. Three turnovers. I mean, that uh, it's going to be interesting, the chess match that goes on between Ryan Tannehill and Lou Anarumo. Those turnovers were big because, you know, short week on the road, this stadium down in Tennessee in, in, in Nashville, it's old. The seats come right up to the sideline. It's like you are right on top of the players. And the, the, the noise just kind of hangs in that stadium. That, that is loud. So nonverbal communication in that stadium is going to be massive. Um, you can't have penalties, these false start penalties. The Bengals had a third and one, and they had Tyler Boyd jump. They had Orlando Brown jump, back-to-back -back plays, false starts, third and 11. You can't do that. That was at home. That was at home last week where the crowd was in support of you against the LA Rams. This place, it gets loud, and you have to be able to handle that. You have to be poised. You have to... Uh, be able to handle the silent snap count. You have to be able to handle the hand signals. Everything goes on the nonverbal communication because of that crowd noise. That's going to be a, a big, big factor down there. Defensively, let's talk about a couple of straws that stir that drink. Up front, Jeffrey Simmons. You go from Aaron Donald, arguably the best interior pressure person in the NFL, to Jeffrey Simmons. That's like going from one to one A. I mean, Jeffrey Simmons is a stud. No two ways about it. He, he provides that internal disruption. There's no question. But he has a better supporting cast than Aaron Donald does now with the L.A. Rams. I mean, they've, they have eight sacks from their primary rush people. Uh, Simmons has two. Danico Autry has three and a half, tied for six most in the National Football League. Arden Key has a sack and a half. Harold Landry has a sack. Those are the pass rushers. So when Simmons is providing the inside pressure, the edge guys are eating. When the edge guys are providing pressure and the quarterback has to step up, Simmons eats. They have a very, very good pass rush. There's no question about it. Very balanced pass rush. 
the Bengals offensive line is going to have another huge challenge. And it's not just Aaron Donald. It's Jeffrey Simmons and others. At the safety position, another straw that stirs the drink, Kevin Byard, 27 interceptions since 2017 when he came in the league. Number one amongst safeties, number two overall in the National Football League. This kid is really good on the back end. And Mike Vrabel disguises well, as we talked about from the Bill Belichick school. Uh, you're going to get simulated pressures. You're going to get blitzes. You're going to get bluffs of the blitz. <laughs> it, it, he muddies it up. There, there's there's no question. He muddies it up. Vrabel does. So does Luana Rumo. That's, and again, that's going to be a big, big deal to me. We talked about some of the penalties, the false start penalties and all that. The Bengals really, they, they got 16 penalties in the first three games. That's not a big number. That's tied for seventh best in the league. 99 penalty yards in three games is not a big number. That is third best in the National Football League. It's not that they have a huge number. It's when they happen. I mean, third and one, back-to-back -back false starts is third and 11. You go from a short yardage goal line play to a play where, where the percentage of you converting against these defenses in the NFL in third and 11 are very, very small, very minimal. We've had penalties that have um, negated a takeaway, a fumble, a turnover by the opponent. Penalty negates it. We've had penalties that have negated sacks for Trey Hendrickson. Hendrickson, this guy, if, if he got all the sacks he was supposed to be credited for, He's got three right now. He had two in the last game. Should have had four. If he had those two sacks that were nullified by penalty, he'd have five. He'd be tied for second most in the NFL. The three sacks he has is tied for ninth most. Uh, but if he had five, he'd be one off the NFL lead of six sacks and tied with others at five. I mean, that's that kind of stuff is the self-destruction that's is extremely painful. The timing has had a big impact and it's been a painful timing. Um, you gotta, you gotta stay away from that. There's no question about it. Tennessee has had their penalty issues. They've been penalized 21 times in three games tied for 24th in the NFL, 170 yards, almost double the yards of the Bengals tied for 17th. It's interesting because both of these teams under Vrabel and, and, uh, and under, under Zach Taylor, the last few years, these have been two of the least penalized teams in the National Football League. So we'll see. We'll see how the how the penalty factor unfolds in this football game. The run game. From 20 to 23, the Tennessee Titans have averaged 141.4 yards per game, fourth best in the NFL offensively. Defensively, from 21 to 23, they've allowed 79.8, best in the National Football League. They like to run it, and they like to suffocate your running game. Mike Vrabel's old school football right there. Little situational football stuff. Third down, Tennessee. Uh, for, in the, in the, from 21 to 23 on third down, they've converted defensively, allowed a conversion rate of 35.4%, second best in the league. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible. This year offensively, they're struggling. They've only converted 27% of the time, 30th in the NFL. The Bengals defense, Lou Anaruma has to get them off the field on third down, no two ways about it. Cincinnati offensively, 36.2%, 21st in the league. Defensively, 35.9%, tied for 13th. Third down is going to be a big deal. Historically, the Ravens have been good on third down. This year, they're not offensively whatsoever. Defensively, they're still playing at a very high level on third down. It's going to be interesting to see how that all unfolds. Red zone. Tennessee Titans from 2019 to 2023, they have converted offensively for a touchdown 68.3% of the time, best in the National Football League. <laughs> this year, they've been in the red zone nine times, scored three touchdowns, 33.3%, 31st in the league, second worst in the NFL. Defensively, they're allowing a conversion rate of 45.5%, 13th, kind of middle of the pack. We know what the Bengals, the Bengals have only gotten there five times this year offensively. That's tied for 29th in the league. They scored three touchdowns and converting into 60% rate. That's tied for 13th. Red zone, third down, red zone, situational football, turnovers. 
They decide a lot of football games. They always will at every level. I don't care what level you're talking about. Tennessee has not given the football up at all for two straight games. They had three giveaways in the opener. They haven't given it up since. Their even turnover ratio on the season. Cincinnati and Tennessee, there are six teams in the NFL that have not lost a fumble this year. Cincinnati and Tennessee are two of those six teams. The Bengals are one of three teams that they haven't even put the ball on the ground. Tennessee has put the ball on the ground once, hadn't, didn't lose it. The Bengals haven't even put it on the ground. They're one of three teams that can claim that. That has to continue. That type of ball security has to continue, and Joe Burrow has to keep the team out of jeopardy with uh, not throwing interceptions, um, particularly in the red zone. Interceptions are not uh, are not anybody's friend in the red zone. They're your, they're your biggest enemy for sure. We talked about the crowd noise at Nissan Stadium. It's going to be rocking. There's no doubt. It's like the dog pound in Cleveland. They, at least they experienced it in week one, so they know what they're looking at. You got to be able to communicate. Um, you got to eliminate uh, eliminate or at least minimize those pre snap penalties. Uh, that's that's going to be massive in this football game. You, you can't you can't self destruct. You're going to have to play as clean a football game as you possibly can on the road. But one thing that you the biggest thing that you have to bear in mind: be as physical as you possibly can be, because Mike Vrabel does not like being embarrassed. <laughs> this guy was a Pro Bowl player in his career when he played with the Steelers and the Patriots. He knows of what he speaks. He's got the utmost respect of his players because he was a great one himself. He's going to have them playing hard. The Bengals have to come out of the locker room ready to roll. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team.